Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to think that topology could revolutionize the field. I'm not sure that I can promise you that today. Uh, but it is a rather ambitious what I want to talk about. Um, and I do do dynamical systems, and I don't assume that everyone here knows dynamics. Uh, so what I'll start to talk with are some examples uh, on why I think we need a new theory for dynamical systems. Uh, again, because I don't think people here are, are dynamicists for the most part, I'll give you a uh, cartoonish version of, of you know, what dynamical systems were, because this is really a talk about differential equations and how to solve differential equations. And so uh, I will talk, tell you, try to inform you that our idea of what it means to solve a differential equation has changed with time, and I'm proposing a, another way to solve it. Uh, and then I will talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, the computational approach that we're developing that's very much based on uh, combinatorics and topology. Um, I'm not sure that I can offer much to computational geometry, uh, but it is clear to me that ideas from computational geometry uh, are essential if, if progress is going to be made on, on this approach that I'm proposing. And uh, then I'll come back and show you how the ideas that I'm proposing can actually be of use to the examples. All right, so let's start with, um, with why. Um, examples, two examples taken from biology about why we need a, a new approach to dynamics. All right, so, you know, if I'm going to talk about revolutionizing dynamics, then we might as well choose big problems. Okay, so let's start with cancer. All right, so this is the RBE2F pathway uh, in humans. Um, I don't really know anything about this. I just pulled this off the web. Uh, what you're supposed to see here, it's very complicated. And this is the network that uh, controls whether cells divide or not. Um, cancer clearly is a case where we have uncontrolled division of cells. Uh, our body wants very much to control cell division. For example, our skin cells are, uh, we need new skin cells at a fairly regular rate. So our body needs to be able to tell a skin cell to develop, to divide, to replicate. But uh, if it doesn't stop replicating, then we're in trouble, all right? So this particular pathway apparently is implicated in most, if not all, human cancers, all right? So there's dynamics going on here. Um, we need to be able to turn, tell cells that they should divide, and we need to be able to tell cells that they don't divide. So I think of this as a problem in dynamics. Uh, this network, every single of these nodes, which of course you can't read, um, and of course, I've even cut off the pathway. I mean, there's so many things involved. Um, all these arrows and these little cells are biochemical reactions. Uh, and most of them are the biochemistry in terms of reaction rates and things like that are unknown. Most of them have probably not even been measured. So they're not even approximated. Um, in fact, what's even worse is that these arrows, probably a lot of those arrows are wrong. There are probably a lot of arrows that are missing. There are probably a lot of nodes that are missing. Uh, so this is a completely incomplete picture of what's going on, uh, perhaps misleading picture, uh, but it's fairly important if we want to understand how to treat cancer to be able to deal with these kinds of problems. All right. So the, the question here is, you know, what kind of models for dynamics should we be using if we want to address the dynamics associated with a system like this? This is essentially unknown. Uh, so our interest in this actually started from a paper that uh, came out of uh, Hughes Lab at, at Duke, and they took this huge hairball and said, well, we, that's way too complicated. Let's just start with this much simpler picture. And uh, their attitude was even this simpler picture is much too complicated. And so what they did was they said, well, let's cluster these things into three groups. And what they would like to decide is which of those interactions are the most important, right? So they're looking for, in some sense, a minimal model based on those clusterings so that they could talk about cells being turned on and turned off, having a switch, right? So 
That's a particular type of example that I'd like to be able to address. Uh, as long as we're talking about big problems, let's talk about malaria. Again, I don't know much about malaria, but I can go to a wiki page and I can copy things and show you pictures. So this is apparently what malaria does when it's living in our, blood, in our bloodstream. Uh, so this is falciparum. Uh, so it has a 48-hour cycle in our bloodstream. Uh, the malaria infects a red blood cell. Inside the red blood cell, it replicates itself. Um, and then after about 48, well, at the end of the cycle, the red blood cell bursts, the malaria come out, and it reinfects the red blood cells. Uh, what's kind of remarkable about this is that that last step takes about a minute or two from when the malaria bursts out of the red blood cells and goes into the, another red blood cell. Even more remarkable is that I've been told that for all intents and purposes, all thousands of red blood cells that are in your body burst simultaneously. All right, so this is a highly, highly synchronized uh, dynamic process. So once again, timing and sequencing of events is essential. The idea is that malaria hides from our immune system because it's in the red blood cells. The only time our immune system could see that it's there is when it's out, but it's only out for one or two minutes, all right? Okay, so I'm no, in no position to judge the veracity of that comment, but if we take that at face value, then this becomes a dynamics problem where, again, timing and sequencing is extremely important. Um, now, before our, one of the cancer problem, I showed you a network, and I said, well, I don't really know what's going on, but at least I started with a network. Uh, in the case of malaria, again, you'd believe that this kind of system is regulated on the genetic proteomic level, uh, but nobody has a network to offer me. The only thing that I have at my disposal is um, time series data. So the way you should look at that is that every single row in there represents a single gene. Where you see bright yellow, it means that that particular gene is expressing itself at a high level with respect to its average level of expression. And where you see a dark color, it means that at that point in time, the gene is expressing itself far below average. So this is time series data taken from malaria grown in a Petri dish, uh, sampled every four hours, I believe. All right. Again, the question is, what models should we be using to solve the dynamics? All right. The, the long-term goal is that if we understood the dynamics, maybe we could give a drug that would disrupt this uh, this 48-hour uh, cycle, desynchronize it, all right? So those are the kinds of dynamics problems that I would like to solve. And what I'd like you to notice is that even though I think it's dynamics, and I think dynamics should be treated with differential equations, you know, x dot equals f of x, I have absolutely no idea what f is, right? But we need solutions. Okay, so that gets back to this question of what does it mean to solve a differential equation? Now, if you go back to the beginning, uh, to Newton, uh, what he did was he wrote down you know, his laws of gravitation. They're very explicit formulas. He took a very simple case, the two-body problem, where he was able to write out an explicit analytic formula for it. And from that analytic formula, we recovered Kepler's laws and you know, the modern idea that, that nature is governed by mathematics is born at this point. All right, we have an explanation for what up till that point is just a data-driven uh, representation of, of how the, the solar system's working. Um, okay, so for the next few hundred years, people worked very hard to find explicit analytic solutions. Here's the initial condition, here's the nonlinearity. What is going to happen to the solution over a given amount of time? Uh, at the end of the 1800s, Poincaré, working on the three-body problem, recognizes that nonlinear dynamics is too complicated. Knowing individual trajectories is not enough to understand what's happening. All right? And so he proposes that what we need to do is to study all solutions to the differential equation simultaneously. All right? And so this gives rise to the notion that a solution to a differential equation is really recovering a flow. So a flow is now a map that takes a, you know, a time 
quantity, an initial condition, a parameter, because we're looking at, at, at physical systems, so parameters involved, fix your parameter, take an initial condition, follow it forward for a certain amount of time, and that's what the flow tells you what the solution will be at, at the end of that time period. All right. Um, another way to look at this, especially if we're thinking in terms of data, is in terms of maps. Imagine you're sampling your system at a fixed time unit, and then you'll have a map from the state at one time to the next time, all right? And so you have your, your map. Again, you should always, from my perspective, one should always be thinking about families of maps or families of flows because there are always parameters in the background that, that uh, have to be controlled or have to be understood. Um, okay, so that's Poincaré. By the um, early 60s, Smale comes along and kind of organizes this into a mathematical a language that we recognize um, and makes it very clear that studying differential equations, the objects of interest should be invariant sets. So these are sets of, con of initial conditions so that if you look at them, it's easier to talk about in terms of maps, one time unit later, you get the exact same set of solutions back again. Um, so if you accept, and this is a big if, if you accept that invariant solutions, invariant sets are the objects of interest if you're trying to solve differential equations, then you have no choice as a mathematician but to accept this definition of when two differential equations or dynamical systems are equivalent, all right? And again, I'm giving them in terms of maps. You say that two maps are topologically conjugate, topologically equivalent, if there's a homeomorphism between the spaces that they're defined in so that the, the maps commute with the homeomorphism. So once we've decided what it means for them to be equivalent, then we care about when are they different? How do they change? And that leads us to bifurcation theory, so again, I have this parameterized family, which might be a low dimensional parameter space, or it might be the space of all dynamical systems. All right? Pick a point, so you're picking a particular, param uh, pick a particular parameter value, so you're picking a particular differential equation, and you say that this point in parameter space is a bifurcation point if in any other neighborhood the dynamics is different. In other words, there's no topological conjugacy to that particular dynamical system. All right? Okay, so that's what modern dynamical systems means to solve differential equations. What's the problem of that? Well, it turns out that this is just an incredibly rich theory. So if I look at the simplest possible map, nonlinear map, which is a quadratic map, and I look at it as a function of parameter values, so my parameter there is r, and I pick a particular value of this r, say 2.8, then the dynamics is really simple. Everything runs to a fixed point. If I pick it a different parameter value, well, it runs to a period two orbit, a period four orbit. So every single vertical line here is a representation of the dynamics. And so as these lines change, what you're seeing is changes in the dynamics. And so what you see from this picture here, which is the simplest possible nonlinear system you can think of, is that arbitrarily small changes in the nonlinearities or in the changes in parameters can lead to dramatic changes in the dynamics. Okay, but I want to solve differential equations where I have no idea what the nonlinearity is and I have no idea what the parameters are, all right? So this perspective, I think, immediately leads to failure, all right? So I want to talk about it from a different perspective, okay? So, I want to talk about combinatorial dynamics. What's the motivation? If we're talking about data-driven science, which I think is becoming popular today, um, or if we just think about modeling, models have a minimum scale at which they make sense. All right? If you're collecting data, you've got a ruler, you've got some form of measurement, there's minimum hash marks on that measurement. All right? And as soon as you say, well, there's a minimum to it, then there's only a finite number of states that I can observe. So let's start with a finite set of states and let's try to redo dynamics from that perspective. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about dynamics in terms of state transition graphs. So I start with a finite graph. The vertices of this graph are supposed to represent the states. What's the dynamics? The dynamics are 
how you get from one state to the next. So it becomes a directed graph. Now, I really think in terms of dynamics, I think in terms of maps. So I'm going to always write a directed graph as a multi-valued map that takes a vertex to sets of vertices. So that's dynamics for me. All right. I don't know the exact state because I'm doing some measurement. So that means even if it's a deterministic system, I don't know exactly where I will end up in the future. OK, so I want to study the dynamics of this. Well, what's the simplest way to decompose this dynamics? Well, I think that if you're doing dynamics, either as you go along, you come back to where you were, or you never come back to where you were. So that's the difference between recurrent and non-recurrent dynamics. And in the level of graphs, it's very easy to identify recurrent dynamics. All right, It should be cycles. And so what I want to do is I want to start with this state transition graph, and I want to produce a simple graph where I've identified the regions in the graph that have this non-trivial recurrent dynamics. So doing this, and for those of you who know anything about algorithms, you know that this is an incredibly fast process. We typically use Tarzan's algorithm, so this is a linear time algorithm to do this. And then I want to understand the reachability. I don't want to know about all these detailed paths that go from the recurrent parts to the recurrent parts. I want to simplify that because even that's too much information. It's going to be very much parameter dependent. So I'm just going to look at the reachability between those. All right. And so I end up going from a state transition graph, which I think of as my dynamics, to a post set. And I'm going to call this post set the Morse graph. All right. Now, from what you should keep in mind is for the rest of the time that I'm talking, from a computational perspective, I think of this as absolutely trivial. I mean, we never, this is definitely not a bottleneck in what I'm doing, so just think of this as the trivial computation. I, I'm happy to do this as many times as I need. All right? Okay, so from dynamics, I produce a Morse graph as a representation of the recurrent dynamics and how you move through the non-recurrent dynamics. But I talked about data. So what is it that you can see in terms of dynamics when you're looking at data? And what I claim is that if you're doing experiments, you have initial conditions, and then you can see where the initial conditions go. So if I think about that from a graph theoretic perspective, then I'm going to talk about an attractor in the graph as being a subset of the graph so that if I look at the action of my map, my multivalued map, if I follow the edges, then I get the same set back again. So let's look at the attractors in this graph. Well, the trivial set is always an attractor. That's a trivial definition, all right? Um, but that little point right down there, that's also an attractor. If you follow it forward, you get back to itself. That's an attractor. Of course, the union of them is an attractor. There's another attractor, and yet another attractor. Now, I drew this picture on the right because I want you to be thinking about lattices. And in fact, one can talk about the lattice of attractors with the, the join and the, and the wedge given by, well, union or taking the maximal uh, attractor in the intersection. All right? So that is the structure that I claim is observable from experiments. The other structure, which I've told you I can compute very, very fast, is what I think is the computable quantity. All right? What's the relationship between them? So let's look at this lattice, and let's look at the join irreducible elements of this lattice. So another way to think of that is to look at the elements of the lattice that have a unique immediate predecessor. All right? So there's only one predecessor here. There are two predecessors there. If I look at those yellow regions, well, that has the same poset structure as my Morse graph. And likewise, if I start with my Morse graph and I look at the lattice of downsets, I get the lattice of attractors that I started with. Now, this is not an accident. This is a very special case of Birkhoff's theorem, which says that, in, con in, in particular for the, what I'm doing, that my Morse graphs contain exactly the same information as my lattice of attractors. And for me, this is very important. Because what I'm claiming to you is that the computable aspects of what I'm interested in 
contain exactly the same information that the observable aspects do. All right? Okay, so you've just seen a large portion of the computational complexity that's involved in what I'm going to be doing, talking about. All right? So now I want to go and talk about dynamics. All right? In a sense, I want to talk about differential equations. And I don't think differential equations are defined on collections of points, finite collections of points, all right? I have to introduce some topology. So how am I going to do that? So let me keep life simple, and let me say that I'm working on a compact metric space, all right? So how I want, to, I want to be able to do this computationally, so I need to take my finite metric space, and I need to break it up into sets that I can work with. And I want to do that in a nice way. And so what I'm going to look at is the lattice of regular closed subsets. Okay? In practice, we'll probably work with triangulations. We'll probably work with cubical complexes or with CW decompositions. All right? So this is a huge lattice that's going to give me approximability on the space that I'm working with. With much, more greater, with much greater generality than I'll probably ever need, but it gives me a universe to work in. All right? Now, of course, I can only make a finite number of measurements, so what I'm going to do is to choose a finite bounded sublattice from this, and that's the space of observables. And if I look at the smallest elements in that lattice L, those will be you know, the hash marks on my ruler. So that's topology. Now let's do some dynamics. So choose a bounded sublattice of this finite set that I'm using for all my measurements. What I claim is I just defined dynamics for you. Normally we think of x dot equals f of x. This is my formulation of x dot equals f of x. Not quite complete, but bear with me and I'll, I'll try to explain to you what I mean by this. All right? Now, notice I've purposely ignored, I mean, I started with a finite dynamic, the combinatorial dynamics, and I had this script F. I've ignored this relationship at the moment. Um, and I've done that because I, I, at the moment, this is all very problem specific. I suspect. To a large extent, it is problem specific, but I also suspect that part of the reason that I can't, you know, nice segue into it right here is because I don't understand enough about it. But this is one of the places where ideas from computational geometry, I think, will play an important role. All right? Okay. I claim that I've declared a, uh, a dynamical system once I've declared this sub lattice of attractors. So, if I have a lattice of attractors, I can use Birkhoff's theorem. And Birkhoff's theorem now defines a post set. Of course, the elements of those post sets are the join irreducible attractors. And for every one of those join irreducible attractors, there's an, a unique predecessor. So I'm going to talk about a Morse tile as being exactly the closure of that attractor, take away its immediate predecessor, which is uniquely defined. All right? And I claim that this is now a structure about dynamics, and I want to understand what I'm talking about, all right, from a, maybe a more classical perspective. Before I get there, however, let, let me try to convince you that we're really doing differential equations at this point, just from a very different perspective. So example, I'll choose you know, a nice, simple piece in the line. What's the natural set of atoms? Well, let's just use integers, all right? So there's my space and the finest demarcations on it. I declare a lattice of attractors. I have now declared the dynamics. All right, so there's my lattice of attractors. Birkhoff says, oh, these are the special points in there. All right, those are the join irreducibles. All right, so I have my Morse tiles. The Morse tile corresponding to one is the minus three minus one interval. Then there's the one three interval. And then I want the Morse tile for three, but the Morse tile for three means look at its immediate predecessor, take it away, 
Well, the immediate predecessor is the union of one and two, so it must be the entire space. Take away blue and green, all right? So those are my Morse tiles. So I've just tiled my space, okay? I, again, I'm telling you I'm talking about differential equations. What does this have to do with differential equations? So I'm in the line, so for pedagogical purposes, let me just say, well, any, any differential equation in a line can be written as a gradient system. All right, so it's just much easier to understand what I'm talking about, but this is not essential. So I'm going to talk about f prime being the antiderivative of f. And what are these, remember when I told you that I wanted to talk about attractors, that's because that's the region of phase space that captures my initial conditions and sees where they go. Okay, so I claim this is a very nice, this is a differential equation, x dot equals minus grad f for that f, I've captured that dynamics because the derivative here is going down, so the flow moves in. The flow moves in, this is an attracting region. The flow moves in, the flow moves in, this is an attracting region. The whole thing is an attracting region. So this particular differential equation fits with the lattice of attractors that I've talked about. So does this differential equation. So does this differential equation. I mean, there's lots of, this is a pretty wild function, but it works because at the level of resolution that I'm looking at this problem, I don't see the difference, all right? Let's keep going with this example. Because I'd like to be able to not just say that I can do differential equations, but I'd also like to be able to go back and talk about the classical theory, because that's what most people understand when we talk about dynamical systems. So let me just define the homology Conley index of the Morse tile to be take the relative homology of the attractor relative to its immediate predecessor. For maps, instead of differential equations, I have to be, oh, here I can actually compute, uh, I, I'll compute them for you, all right? For this simple example, the, the Morse set, the Morse tile one is just the interval with no exit set, so that's the homology. Same thing for the green one. The red one has that as its homology, all right? It's homology on the first level. For flow, for maps, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to look at the induced map on the homology of that pair. Um, by now, there are lots of tools for computing homology. And you can compute the induced map on homology for this little f without needing to know f. All you need to know is the action on the tiles, all right? And there are papers that show you how to do that, all right? So homology is a very crude tool. It allows you to compute without knowing the particular function that you're interested in, okay? So I claim that I can compute these, and I can compute them reasonably efficiently, not as fast as I can compute the, the, the Morse graphs, but reasonably fast. Here is a fundamental theorem. And the theorem says that if the Conley index of a Morse tile is non-trivial, then there must exist a non-empty invariant set. So these are the invariant sets that I was talking about earlier. Well, where is the f, the little f that's generating the dynamics? Any one that is commensurate with the lattice of attractors that I defined for you originally. And here's a theorem about the dynamics, all right? So in this particular example, I've computed the Conley indices for you. And so what I've told you is there has to be an invariant set here, there has to be an invariant set here, and there has to be an invariant set there because the Conley indices are non-trivial. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about Morse theory, this is not a surprise, right? I mean, I've put a gradient flow for you, and uh, there's a minimum and there's a minimum and there's a saddle. Uh, notice that the dimension where the homologies are non-trivial are actually the Morse indices. But I've also computed 
this information for you for that flow and more importantly for that flow and Morse theory definitely doesn't classical Morse theory definitely does not give you those answers for the red region for the red dynamical system All right. okay so the moral is that we can make non-trivial statements about dynamics even if I don't know the right hand side of my differential equation Now, this Conley index, and I'm not going to go into any of this, but it can be used to, do, to prove theorems about the existence of fixed points, periodic orbits, connecting orbits, even chaotic dynamics. All right? So there's, there's a lot of machinery out there now about telling you about dynamics if you've computed the Conley index and know a little bit more about the geometry of the space that was used to compute the Conley index. Let me show you one theorem, and I do this because persistent homology has become a, a very popular tool in topological data analysis. And I think this is very relevant with respect to the ideas of, of persistent homology. So Francesa proved that, there's, that in this context, there's a strictly upper triangular boundary operator, which is defined on the Conley indices. So what you should really think about this as being is a topological generalization of Morse homology. Right? So in the context of the simple example that I've given you, all right, where there's my lattice of attractors, that's my definition of dynamics, and there is the, the Morse graph that's associated to it. So there's the three Morse sets. Those are the homologies of those Morse sets. That will be the induced boundary operator on that complex. And what I claim is that if I start with that complex and now you decide you want a filtration and you want a filtration that consists of one, two, three, or two, one, three, or one, two, and three, then using that boundary operator, if you run the persistent homology algorithm on it, you will get persistent homology back again for this complex. So, this object right here contains more information than persistent homology. And what I claim, notice the word claim. We're working on this, trying to write it up right now. I don't have all the proofs. But I claim that this is no more expensive to compute than persistent homology. All right? But this keeps much, much more of the geometry than persistent homology does. Now, there's a big open problem. What is the topology of the space of these connection matrices? That's what these boundary operators are called, uh, that still needs to be resolved. Uh, it's going to be a much wilder space in the space of persistence diagrams, but we do have much more geometric information, and this, I claim, is computable with at least the same asymptotic cost. But it's just a claim. I don't, claim, I don't have the proof written down yet. Okay. That was the theory of dynamics. How do we actually use this if we're going to try to address the problems that I mentioned at the beginning, the, the cancer and the malaria problems? So this is where we have to get into choosing L and choosing F. And again, this is a place where I think ideas from computational geometry and computational algebraic geometry have a big role to play. So I'm going to choose a particular choice of L and F that is relevant to this problem. At the moment, every time we get a new problem, we kind of have to think about new ways to choose it. This is a particular choice for these class of problems. I would like to have a bigger perspective on it, but I don't at this point in time. OK, so biological model. I'm thinking about a not model that's given to me in the form of maybe one of these regulatory networks. So how do I want to interpret this information? How do I want to think of a class of differential equations that this defines for which I'm going to give you solutions about the dynamics? So for each one of these nodes, there's some kind of species floating around. Let xi denote the quantity or the concentration. If these are biological objects. They will fall apart. They'll decay. Or if the cell is growing, their concentration will naturally decrease. 
So let's not throw away that information. Let's go to you know, the first quarter of calculus and say, well, the differential equation that would correspond to that would be dx dt equals minus some decay rate times x. That's the easy part. What's the proposed model? Well, there should be that decay of each individual, but then somehow the rest of the network is communicating with it. Right? So there's some kind of communication going on. I have no idea what that is, other than it's given to me by that diagram that the biologist has handed to me as their model. Okay, I unfortunately was only given 50 minutes to talk rather than all afternoon. So rather than getting into the complexity of this in general, let's uh, substitute and just pretend that it's a dependent on only one other species. All right? So if I see two nodes that are connected by one of these arrows with a blunt end, what the biologist, I think I'm being fair to the biologist, what they would say is that this represents that, that x1 is supposed to re repress the production of x2, which geometrically to me means that if I have low levels of x1, then I expect the, the production of x2 to be higher. And if I have high levels of x1, then I expect the production of x2 to be lower. Of course, I have no idea what this is because I started my talk by telling you I don't know any of the parameters. I don't know the biochemistry. And if there's a, a pointy arrow, then it should be just the other way around. That should be activation. But let's not worry about that for the moment. All right? OK, I've got to quantify things somehow. So let's call upper level u and lower level l. I do not know the numbers. I'm not going to pretend to know the numbers. I'm just giving them names. And there should be you know, some place where you change from upper to lower. I have no idea where that is, but let's give it a name. All right? And what do I care about now? Now what I care about is if I'm to the left of this name threshold, do I expect things to be going up or do I expect them to be going down? And if I'm to the right, do I expect things to be going up or do I expect things to be going down? That's the level at which I'm going to try to look at this dynamics. All right? So just to simplify the notation, let me just call this to be that nonlinearity that's there. So all I care about is the sign of that quantity. I want to emphasize that when I've done this, I've introduced for every node in my graph, a parameter, the decay rate, and I've introduced these three parameters, high, low, and somewhere in between in terms of a threshold where, where you change from high to low. But they're not numbers, they're just parameters, all right? <coughs> so let's put this together for the simplest network possible, the toggle switch. This was actually one of the first synthetic genetic switches. It was done by uh, Collins Group. Um, <clears throat> so let's think about that from this perspective. The phase space is going to be two dimensions, because there's two variables that I'm keeping track of, x1 and x2. Um, the parameter space, well, we're now in an eight-dimensional parameter space. Uh, I'm going to talk about regular parameter values. I want all my parameters to be positive. The upper should be higher than the lower. If I had multiple edges coming out, I'd have to worry about the values of those thresholds. Just, just let's not assume they're absolutely equal. And I care about whether this is pointing up or down, I told you. So let's not be in a situation where it's exactly equal to zero. <clears throat> so if I choose one of these regular parameter values, then I've in particular chosen the thetas. So there are the thetas. So I've now performed, put hash marks on my phase space. And now I want to understand what's the dynamics doing with respect to these hash marks. So you've got to look at that inequality. If at this value it's bigger than zero, I'll be moving to the right. If at this value it's less than zero, it'll be moving to the left. I now want to produce the state transition graph. I have to tell you, what are the vertices? The vertices are going to be the regions, the domains, and the co-dimension one faces between the domains. 
and I'm going to have to have rules between them. So if there are arrows pointing into my domain, then take the node that's on that face and map it to the node that represents the domain. If it's an arrow pointing out, go from the domain to its face that it's pointing out to. And if you're in a situation where there are no out faces, then put a self loop on the domain. That's a set of rules. They're more sophisticated rules that I could make, but they'll be computationally more expensive. These are incredibly cheap to evaluate. <coughs> so fix a regular parameter value. For example, pick any one of the parameter values that satisfies this set of inequalities. All right? For this particular simple example, you see these are linear inequalities. If I had a more complicated network, these would become semi-algebraic sets of inequalities, but they're also very, very simple ones. They are multilinear. Can't even get quadratic, just multilinear. That's at worst. Okay? So for this set of parameter values, I can check all those inequalities. That's the direction of my arrows. I use the rules that I established. Those are the, that's now my script F, my state transition graph. I compute the Morse graph of that, and I get a single node, which is that node right there. And I'm going to label it as 0, 1, because it's before the first threshold and after the first threshold in that direction. All right? So this computation, I hope you understand, is absolutely trivial. Even when you make the network bigger, this particular computation is trivial. So you give me the network, and we run it through the DSGRN database software, and out comes the parameter space. You take your entire eight-dimensional space, it subdivides it into nine regions. That's an algebraic geometry computation. And I'm telling you what the Morse graph is for every one of those regions. All right? So I now know the dynamics over all of parameter space in terms of these language, this language of Morse graphs, and one can go through and query for what kind of a dynamics one's interested in. So as kind of an introduction to that, let me just try to tell you why the toggle switch is a switch. All right, that's the graph, that's the input. This is the phase space. This is the database. Let's change one of the parameters. So for example, if you vary theta 1 from small to large, and it's probably very hard to see with the resolution of this, uh, what we're really doing is just moving across horizontally. Now, what's a switch supposed to be? A switch is supposed to be like the thermometer in your house, right? When the temperature is low, the thermos is on, temperature goes up, the thermos turns off the furnace, the house cools down, the furnace goes back on. And you want this overlap so that your thermostat isn't going, turning the furnace on and off instantaneously. So that's a nice, healthy switch. Can I see that via the database? Well, I claim yes, it's trivial. You see, if I run along this region through the middle graph, the middle path in my parameter graph, then I actually go from something that says there is a fixed point 0, 1 to a place where there are two fixed points to a place where there's a single fixed point. So this is a very simple graph query. All right. Okay, so let's now apply this to actual models. How much more time do I have? So let's choose models. So this is coming out of the Yao's paper. Uh, I told you there's a complicated network, there's a simpler network, and what they're looking for are edges. So they have to have a criterion for what is a good model. All right? Now, this is supposed to be a switch. This is the switch that our body uses to control whether our cell should replicate or not. Okay? So what you should see is they want the minimal network that is going to exhibit this hysteresis where biologically R B on E2F means don't reproduce, R B off 
RB is off, E2F is on, so the levels are low and high, means reproduce. All right? So they want the network diagram there that over the largest range of parameter values gives the existence of a switch. Okay, they're biologists. What do they do? They pick a particular nonlinearity. Hill functions are one that biologists like. There's absolutely no biophysical justification for choosing Hill, <coughs> Hill uh, nonlinearities, but they're simple to work with. So they take Hill functions, put them in. They don't know what the parameters are, so they choose 20,000 parameters at random, but we're in a very high dimensional parameter space, so 20,000 parameters is absolutely nothing. And then they run simulations, and they run simulations for every one of the networks. And they say, the quality of my model is the number of parameters that exhibit by stability divided by the 2,000 samples that I took. Okay, so let's redo this using this idea of solving differential equations. So for each possible regulatory network, I'm going to compute a database. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, S is the signal, right? That's like the thermometer. I care about whether it's low or it's high to turn on or turn off the furnace. So what I do is I look at paths that vary with beta regulating its, uh, the temperature, the, the size, the, the value of the temperature, or theta. And I'm going to look at the number of paths at, when you vary the theta SS that exhibit hysteresis. So the higher that number, the better my model. So if we do that, then the top two networks we get are these networks. Right? So that's a choice of particular edges. And that agrees with what comes out of the, the Yao paper. And the Yao paper actually, I mean, they're biologists. They actually went back and did experiments. All right? So that's their justification for the mathematics. Our justification now is we did the mathematics. Same, we did a different form of solving the solution, the differential equations. We reproduced our results. But for us, this is a trivial computation. So we can go and look at larger networks. And that's where it starts getting a little bit interesting. So why bunch it into three things? Let's break it up in a little bit more. All right, so now you have a bunch of possible edges. Let's do exactly the same computation. And what are the result? Well, from the DSGRN, the best network that we get for switch, for control, for replication of the cell, is this network. If you go to yeast, where there have been a lot of experiments done, this is a cell cycle net entry switch for yeast. And what you see is that those networks look very similar. What's very interesting is that there is absolutely no homology on the biological level, between the genes here and the genes here. Which maybe suggests that evolution, in choosing a switch, likes this particular architecture. All right? That's an open question. I'm not sure how we decide that, other than observing that when we try to understand this in the human network, this is the optimal network. And this is what yeast is doing, and this is the experimental data. All right? And given the kind of model that we've set up, we've examined all of parameter space, not just some fraction of parameter space. OK, let's go to malaria. Here I don't have any idea what the networks are. Uh, remember, I told you, as you go across, this bright yellow means it's 1.5 times the average. If it's dark, it means it's uh, the average divided by 1.5. Okay, so this is just relative to the average. So yellow in one row has nothing to do with yellow in another row. So I'm just going to take the data from here, and I'm going to normalize it. High and low. Okay, 
And what I'm going to keep track of is who comes first in terms of high and low, orders of, relevant, of, of extrema. And I'm going to try to use that to decide what models will work. So I have my experimental data. Somebody comes along, and I'm completely agnostic as to how this is done, but I will say there are lots and lots of computational biologists who are trying to figure out algorithms to produce these networks. I'm happy to have them give me potential networks. There's a potential network, and I want to ask, is this network capable of reproducing the experimental dynamics? Okay, for this, the data, the, the parameter graph has about 45,000 nodes. This takes about a second to do on a laptop, to produce the parameter graph, right? If you give me a large, but everything's completely parallelizable, all right? So I'm really only limited at the moment to the number of processors you're willing to give me, and more importantly, the amount of storage you're willing to give me for the database, all right? <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make my database, and then I'm gonna query. Is there a Morse graph? Now remember, Morse graphs are keeping track of recurrent dynamics and the gradient dynamics. So what I want to do is to say, well, what's observable is probably at the bottom of my Morse graph. The data, everything's oscillating in the data, so I want to find a node, a minimal node of my Morse graph, where if I went back to the recurrent set, I would see that every player was oscillating. Okay, that's easy. We actually store that before we make the, the database because we know that's what we're interested in. And there are 96 out of these 45,000 parameter nodes at which there is a minimal node which involves oscillation of all the variables. That's an example of one of those Morse graphs. All right. Okay, question is, those numbers correspond to the genes up there. If I take those particular genes and I look at their max and mins, I want to know whether that network is capable of reproducing the order of max and mins. Well, to do that, I go back to one of those nodes in the parameter graph, and I recompute this. Oh, before I do that, I look at this data and I say, well, look, uh, where are the maxes happening? Well, I don't know which one comes first. The, the cyan, the purple, or the green max, and I definitely don't know which comes first, the blue or the yellow or the red min. But they do come before the yellow max, and I'll claim that that comes before the red max, and then, once again, I'm not quite sure who's first in terms of the max and mins. It's a post set. I care about linear orders. I go back, I recompute the state transition graph, which I claim takes no time. And now what I want to know is, as I wander through the state transition graph, can I get a linear ordering of this? So we've produced a, a polynomial time algorithm to do this. And so we test all the max-min sequences over all possible linear extensions, and the answer is no. All right, so that means you can throw away this model. This model, oops, one back. This model that I had up there, that network, absolutely cannot generate the experimental dynamics. Here's our current best model. How did we get this? We took a lot of inputs until we got one that had a lot of nodes at which we were, a lot of parameter values at which we were able to reproduce the dynamics. And then we started randomly searching nearby. Take out an edge, take out a node, put in an edge, put in a node, compute the parameter graph, do the search. We did about a thousand of these. It took a couple of hours on a, on a small cluster. This is very fast to do. And this particular network has about nine billion regions in its parameter graph, and almost 50% of them reproduce that dynamics. Now, this isn't quite good enough for us to go back to the biologist for. I think we need to do a much bigger search. But this is a suggestion 
that this approach, you know, we're looking at a 59 dimensional parameter space. I don't know of any other technique in differential equations that allows you to search these high dimensional parameter spaces, all right? And as efficiently, all right? Okay, so I'm probably over time, so let me stop, but let me emphasize that Sean Harker has done a lot of the algorithms and implementation. The biology has been done much with, uh, with Thomas Gettian and Bree Cummings. Bill Calise and Rob Vandervoorst are working with me on the theory of this approach to dynamics. Thank you very much. Thank you.